Cool. Welcome everyone to our first um, tutorial in the run-up to Azarix and thank you Yossi for taking your time and being our first speaker. Yes, I wish everyone an interesting afternoon and I will stop sharing now and Yossi, you can start sharing. And do you see me now? Yes, yes of course. Yes, you see me. Hello everybody. I'm happy to oh. see you also in this nice summer afternoon. Uh, it is Yes, it is very nice to meet you. It is 33 degrees outside. Um, Germany and France are out of the Euro. S Switzerland is going to be playing Ukraine. I don't know what to support. I mean, what is this? What are these countries? Fantastic countries. Uh, um, but <laughs> so let's see. Um, let's kind of get, get the calibration of... of uh, of the audience here. So uh, please uh, raise your hand if you know how to use the raise your hand feature in Zoom. Okay, so, okay, so I hope, so there are seven raised hands and 27 participants. There is a raise uh, your hand button on the toolbar. So, okay, we're getting closer. Okay, 12 people, 13. 14, I think this is as good as we can go. Great, okay. So, um, uh, so you can uh, take your hands down. Uh, raise your hand if you are uh, a student. How many of you are students? Okay, very good. So half and half, or, or maybe there is a correlation between people who don't know how to raise their hands and people who are not students, maybe. You're taught in school to raise your hand. And uh, final question, uh, please raise your hand if you know what prime and probe is. So if you know what prime and probe is, kindly raise your hand. Uh, and okay, so, so as you know, it is traditional in every presentation about side channel attacks in the past three years to teach about what is Spectre and what is Prime and Probes? So it is my responsibility as the first speaker of the tutorial. I will be explaining Prime and Probe, and I'll let uh, somebody in the future talk about what is Spectre. You're probably going to get it. Okay, so now we can we can thankfully begin. I want to talk to you about uh, Prime and Probe Zero. It's a very very fun, uh, very fun attack, uh, very fun paper. Uh, and uh, because this is a tutorial, half of the time allocated will be for teaching. I will be talking to you and interacting with you in the chat, and you can just ask questions. And uh, then we'll have a little break, and in the little, uh, the second half, we will have a real demo. And this demo, I am so confident about uh, uh, about uh, this attack that I will actually be uh, allowing you to run uh, side channel attacks on your own PCs. And you know what, it's nice because half of you are in the group which is either not a student or uh, not raising your hand. So please raise your hand if you're connected to the internet right now through a corporate network or some kind of VPN or firewall or intrusion detection system. If you're working for, I don't know, Deutsche Telekom or for the, uh, what's the name of these guys who uh, starts with B Three letters, uh, three letter agency starting with B. They're like the German NSA. How do you call them? B something. So, uh, okay, so you don't have to raise your hand if you work for them, uh, but uh, that will be fun if you can try to do some cybersecurity attack on this uh, German NSA network. So uh, we can begin uh, with the scientific content. So uh, this again is joint work with uh, many, many uh, distinguished uh, uh, fellow researchers, uh, but uh, the lead researcher is, uh, is this, uh, this, this is my lab in, you know, uh, when we were hanging out together. Thank you, BND, thank you very much. And, uh, and you see uh, the, the main uh, researcher behind this work is Anatoly. And you see Anatoly is very careful about safety. He is the only one in our lab who is very insistent 
not to wear sandals because sandals are a safety hazard. So uh, uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, his research in particular. And um, while I'm talking about uh, cash attacks and all that and motivation, maybe this is boring and you want to go right to the demo. So uh, we can say goodbye now and you can go and, uh, and, and open this link and start playing with the proof of concept. And we will all meet you in an hour or so, if, if you like. Uh, otherwise, you can continue with, with, uh, with us and stay for the rest of the class. So um, I'm Yossi, and, and my research is in the field of what is called implementation attacks. And what are implementation attacks? Uh, we have um, some kind of secure device, uh, famously known as the device under test. And, and this device has kind of one, some kind of secret inside it. And as an uh, attacker or as a security evaluator, of course, my objective is to get this secret outside as fast as possible and you know, as efficiently as possible. And uh, in, in, the, in the world of, uh, of classical attacks, uh, this is the game I can play. So, here is my device and my device gets all sorts of inputs and, and, and it does some kind of computation and it emits outputs. And I can maybe, you know, depending on my attacker model, I can maybe control uh, the inputs or I can iter interact, iter iteratively improve my inputs until I get to the right input and observe the outputs. And then I'm trying to find some kind of mathematical relationship between the inputs and the outputs, which can lead me toward the secret. Uh, but of course, this is sometimes uh, very difficult for the attacker because this device might be uh, using very uh, good cryptography, which was uh, developed um, uh, by uh, standards bodies such as uh, you know AES and other kinds of standard encryption protocols. So this isn't uh, good enough for me as an attacker. I can't actually get the secret out. So what does the uh, implementation security analyst do uh, to get the secret out. What can we do? Can you suggest in the chat? How can I get the secret out of side of my device? Okay, so uh, Eleanor is suggesting what is called rubber hose cryptography. I threaten the owner of the device with a candy bar and uh, I tell the owner of the device, if you tell me the password, I will give you a candy bar. Or I tell the owner of the device, your boss told me to give me the secret and so on. Uh, this is a, a human uh, research. It's fantastic and fascinating. I don't do it. But I can, uh, what can I do in, in a very, very wide thematic way? So uh, uh, Jon is, is getting, uh, is, is talking about the general category of it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat. And I'm going to treat this device, uh, because I'm an engineer, I can treat this device as an actual uh, machine which works in the physical world. And because this machine works in the physical world, it also interacts with the physical world. And the first thing I can do is look at the outputs of this machine as it operates. And these outputs aren't just the standard output, but uh, all sorts of hints and advice that the device is giving me uh, without wanting to do it. Why is the device doing it? Because this is a physical device made out of silicon and glass and conducting wires and so on. And it's in a real world where, where you know, Maxwell laws and Newton's laws hold and all that. And, and this device is working and it's not only giving me the output, it's also telling me, for example, how much time, uh, as, uh, as Olaf suggested, how much time it takes to perform a certain computation. It might also uh, consume different amount of power so I can measure the power consumption of the device. Uh, I can look at uh, the electromagnetic radiation of the device. Um, so uh, maybe um, because the device has um, electrons th flowing through it, when an electron moves, it generates an electromagnetic wave which radiates. So maybe I can put an antenna and listen to that. And um, what I'm going to be talking about today uh, which is very fashionable, is uh, it's actually going to do uh, something to the microarchitectural state of the device. Ah, what is a microarchitectural state? Uh, all will be uh, described in a couple of minutes. 
What I can tell you is why is the microarchitectural state such a nice thing to analyze? Because uh, the risk to the health and safety of the graduate student uh, who is measuring power consumption and can get electrocuted or is measuring uh, electromagnetic radiation and can get turned into a superhero by strange radiation, uh, or I don't know, uh, uh, microarchitectural uh, attacks there are very uh, easy to run and very safe. Uh, and of course, I, I need to explain what they are, but it's very easy to find out the microarchitectural state of a device. It's very easy to explain to a security analyst, a systems analyst, listen, your device is in problems because if I can look at the microarchitectural state of your device and I can get secrets out, uh, then the secret is compromised. So this is the first step as a, an implementation uh, attacker, implementation analyst. But there is an additional um, suggestion, which uh, Olav was suggested. And this is to take this uh, attack from the realm, realm of the passive attack into the opposite of passive. What is the opposite of passive? Thank you, active attacks. So active attacks, uh, they are attacks uh, which actually influence. So now I'm announcing to the world that I am the attacker and I'm here and you should be careful. So maybe, you know, maybe I don't want to announce it, but I'm announcing it. And the first thing I can do is control the inputs of the device. And controlling the inputs of the device could be uh, what, um, what you know as fuzzing, right? I, I can give all sorts of, um, uh, strange uh, inputs to the device, which can cause it to, to create errors. So uh, why are errors important? Because sometimes the errors occur in the middle of the computation and, and maybe an error the input, if I measure the time it creates an error input, is very interesting. Maybe the inputs are so specially crafted that they actually crash the device. And then I can uh, you know dump the memory and so on. We try not to do this because that is kind of, uh, you know, there's a bug, so let's fix the bug. We're trying to find things which aren't bugs. So I can, again, I can shoot lasers at the device. Uh, I can uh, heat up the device, maybe put it in the sun. And uh, again, something which is very fashionable and, and fantastic, I can um, actually um, write to some kind of state registers of the device and make the device uh, operate in unsafe uh, conditions. For example, if the device is supposed to operate at uh, you know, 1.4 volts, I'm going to make it operate at 1.2 volts, and then some kind of memory corruption is going to happen. And it's fun that these things are actually controllable uh, in software for power saving reasons and, and power management reasons and so on. So um, we have the passive attacker and we have the active attacker and um, together we are going to get out the secret. And, and as I said, again, the secret here is much easier to get. Uh, you could have a perfect protocol. Let me be as, as uh, blunt as possible. Uh, what is the most powerful encryption scheme known to humanity? Does anybody know? What is the most powerful encryption scheme? One-time pad. Thank you. Thank you, Elino. Thank you. Okay. Uh, One-time pad is uh, theoretically unbreakable because for every pair of plain text and ciphertext that you give me, I can find the key which will take you from this plain text to this ciphertext, which means seeing as many plain texts as you want doesn't teach you anything about the ciphertext. And yet, uh, one-time pad can be broken by implementation attacks. When was it broken? Does anybody know? 1941, in a fantastic paper. And, uh, this, isn't, this isn't an enigma. This is actually uh, the Americans broke their own systems. Uh, and then they found out possibly that the Russians were already doing it. Uh, you can read it in the NSA website. Uh, what is the URL for the NSA website? I guess you can just say, hey Siri, Tell the NSA guy to print out the website and it will appear on your screen. Okay, so, um, so this is nice and this is, very, this is what I'm doing. It's, it's very interesting and very important. Uh, but the thing we're kind of hand-waving around is, uh, what is this uh, secret? What is this secret? This, this is a secret, something which the device has and, and we really want to, to keep it hidden 
And, and when we can find it, we can write a paper and we're very happy. So what is this secret? What is the secret? So I, I think you're right, right? Eleanor was saying the right, the, the common secrets which people analyze and, and talk about are encryption keys. So there is an encryption key inside the device. And, and I'm very happy as an attacker uh, because encryption keys are very short. They are, you know, 128 bits, stuff like that. And when I get them out, I can say, okay, I hacked your device. This is lovely. So encryption key is one kind of secret. Uh, what other things which are secret can be inside the device? So just reading out data. Okay, I can read out data, but, you know, maybe it's just, you know, I'm reading out whatever, some kind of Windows executable that you have. What? So encrypted data. So maybe I'm, I, I don't get the key out, but I can find out all sorts of data. Okay, so Eleanor is getting, uh, is getting so let's talk about what Jans is saying. And uh, so Jans is saying, Eleanor, I'll get to you. Very good, very insightful. Uh, Jans is saying also very insightfully that uh, there are secrets inside the device which aren't encryption keys, but for example, um, could be um, the cookie. You know what cookies are, right? When I log in to a server, I provide my username and password, and maybe I do all sorts of, you know, one time, uh, you know, uh, um, I, I use a phone app and, and whatever. But when this is finished, uh, the website uh, says, okay, uh, you are allowed to join my system. And, and the server gives me a random number called a cookie. And this random number, uh, I will send it to the server with any subsequent request, and it will use whatever authentication process it ran before to, to keep me logged in. So if I can steal as an attacker this cookie, this login credential, I can masquerade as a user even, uh, even though I don't know the user's password and so on. Um, Another interesting thing which you can recover using implementation attacks are uh, secret random numbers generated by the operating system. For example, uh, for the TCP sequence number, if I know the TCP sequence number, I can um, take over network connections. Um, I can steal, for example, um, um, the kernel memory layout of the system. So, um, if I find out where interesting functions are hidden in memory, I can jump to them and then build some kind of attack from that uh, and so on. But now I want to talk about uh, what Eleanor says. Um, all of these secrets are kind of, you know, computer secrets, right? I'm, I'm getting bytes, the, the random number state or the cookie. These are random numbers. Uh, but there are also secrets which are secrets to me, the user, and not to the computer. And, and a good example of that is, who am I? Who is the user? And what can I talk, what can you tell me? What can the attacker find out about this user? For example, um, what is the political affiliation of the user? What did I vote in the last elections? As, as you know, in Israel, we have elections once every month or so. Uh, we are very good in having elections. What did I vote in the last elections? Uh, do I belong to some kind of a minority, religious minority, gender minority, sexual minority? Uh, do I have a medical condition which I'm hiding from my employer? Um, do I have, uh, do I log on to some kind of whistleblower website or do I participate in some kind of forum which is forbidden in my country? Uh, right, so uh, let's see, Google account, searching for passport license. Hmm. Very good, that's, that's true. Um, so uh, I'm actually in, in my field of research, uh, mostly focusing on human secrets, which are the secrets which the computer doesn't really care if they're compromised, but I, the owner of the user of the computer, really uh, care about how they're compromised. So uh, let's talk about uh, what kind of attack I'm going to talk about today. And today I'm going to talk about a uh, kind of micro architectural attack 
uh, called a cache attack. And to explain what is a microarchitectural attack, I will use the following motivating slide. So um, computers are very uh, well designed to protect apps from other apps and users from other users. Uh, definitely, uh, if we have, for example, um, two programs open on your phone, right? Uh, one of the programs cannot access the memory of the other program and read out, uh, you know, the, the secret data inside this memory. For that reason, you can open your Uber app and, and, and invite, you know, a cab, and then you can uh, send a text message to somebody and saying, uh, okay, I'm going to, to your house, please prepare the drugs and so on, or whatever you're buying. Uh, and of course, the Uber, Uber app doesn't know that you're going, that doesn't get the content of the message. And there are other kinds of protections. Uh, for example, uh, the user and the kernel are protected from each other. So for example, uh, I might have uh, encryption keys in my kernel in the lower level of the operating system, uh, but uh, an app just running on my, for example, a web page is not supposed to steal away all of these things. And there is also what is called virtual machines, right? Virtual machines, uh, we have uh, a, a computer running on our own hardware, which thinks that it's a real computer alone in the world, but this computer is actually running in software inside in another, a larger computer, and this uh, the small the virtual machine cannot see anything about the host. So how is all of this realized? It's realized using architectural protections. Um, the, the operating system and the CPU, actual hardware of the CPU, know how to isolate and separate programs from each other. For example, uh, the memory space, the entire memory space of a virtual machine uh, is isolated using the CPU from the memory space of the other virtual machines or of the host. So uh, I have a contract. Uh, I have an agreement with the CPU. I have an agreement with the operating system. And uh, when I tell the operating system, for example, uh, please give me a piece of memory, which is for my exclusive use, and my CPU uh, is going to support this. No other application on the computer is going to uh, be able to access this memory. And this is the architecture of the computer. This is the contract I have as a, as a software developer with the hardware, with the underlying system. But there is something called microarchitecture. And microarchitecture means how does the CPU how does the memory, how does the operating system actually realize this contract? What is it doing internally to give me, for example, uh, the isolation between myself and another application? And in theory, I shouldn't care about this microarchitecture. This isn't part of my business. This is part of the operating system of the CPU and so on. And this is, uh, there. Th th just if you think about it, you can uh, change, completely change the microarchitecture from one generation of CPU to the next. And if the contract, if the architecture stays the same, everything should work. So uh, microarchitectural attacks uh, are attacks which actually um, exploit, and this is by uh, definition of Akikmes from 2011, they actually exploit the components which are below the trust boundary. So we have this very good, uh, separation in the level of the contract, my agreement with the CPU, with the system. But the way it is implemented internally actually lets me uh, peek inside the system and see what's going on and get all sorts of attacks. And there are various types of uh, microarchitectural attacks. And the one which is the most common and which I'm going to talk about today is what is called the cache attack. So what is a cache? Um, kind of give you a motivation. This is 50 cent and he's eating a cash sandwich. Uh, what is a cache? So um, computers are getting faster every day um, and every year by orders of magnitude. And uh, this is uh, the CPU, the central processing unit, which uh, has a clock, a very, very fast clock. You know, what is the speed of the clock on your CPU or on your phone? 
gigahertzes, right? 10 to the power of nine instructions per second. Multicore, you can do 12 instructions at the same time, three billion times a second. So the CPU is very, very fast. But the problem is that the memory of, of the system, the memory, the main memory, what is called the DRAM, it's not catching up. It's not keeping up to, to the speed of the CPU. So it is getting faster, but it's getting faster at a lower uh, rate. So if you would look, for example, at the Apple IIe personal computer, which was very, very long ago, the CPU and the memory were at the same speed. But now the CPU is a thousand times faster than the memory. Uh, and this is very problematic because everything the CPU has to do involves some kind of interaction with the memory. And if all the CPU can do is wait for the memory to read data or to write data, then we will be in a very bad shape. Our performance will actually be very, very slow. And this has been realized uh, a long time ago. And the solution to that is to take a piece of memory, which is, first of all, more expensive, more, it's expensive, it's faster, it's smaller, which is uh, important because of the reason, because of physics, and it's closer to the CPU. So it's actually it could be inside the CPU silicon, uh, which is in your board. And this memory is called the cache memory. Uh, and it is designed to keep the pieces of memory, which are the most important to the program, which is currently running. Uh, what this is called is the working set. And if you can you know, think of the own code you're, write, you're writing, usually your CPU isn't running like crazy over the entire memory, but it has a small amount of data and a small amount of code, which it is currently interacting with. And, and this working set, if I can get this working set into the cache, then I will be running very, very quickly. And there is a lot of art, a lot of thought in the computer architecture community on how to build these caches and how to find what should I put in this working set and so on. So uh, the cache is not part of what I should care about as a software programmer. I'm writing a program. In my program, there is code. In my program, there is memory. There is some data. And uh, when I access the code, or access the memory, to access the, the variables of my code, uh, the CPU is going to have to decide, do I want to put this piece of data, this piece of code inside my uh, cache so it will be quicker to access. And the CPU manages all of this independently. And the cache is in fact part of the microarchitecture of the system. And of course, if I cannot access somebody else's uh, memory, because we are, for example, in different virtual machines, then I obviously cannot access somebody else's cache, because again, this cache doesn't belong to me, and I am prevented by the contract. But because of the way uh, the cache is implemented, I can actually learn some things about the cache. And this is uh, the cache attack. and. Uh, more about this very, very soon. Uh, so you want to, some questions? This is a tutorial. So anybody want to make any question or remark so far? OK. Um, so now let's give you a motivating story. I want to talk about a human secret. And I want to talk about how to attack it using a cache attack. And um, OK, let's continue. So I want to talk about uh, an imaginary country, uh, which, be, which will motivate us today. And this country is called uh, Freedom Land. Freedom Land uh, did not participate in the Euros because they do not know what football is. They have a very strange conception of what is football. Freedom land, a very nice country. Uh, and in this country, uh, this imaginary country, there are two uh, governing religions. And um, there is uh, the elephant worshipers. And there are, uh, you know, the other religion in this country. There are the uh, 
the donkey worshipers. So two uh, religions. And, um, and in Freedom Land, uh, the people are very, very friendly, but the people, uh, the monkey, the, the donkey religion uh, worshipers are very uh, unfriendly to the elephant worshipers and so on. So, uh, so the, the elephant worshipers think that the donkey worshipers are, uh, you know, uh, communist traitors, uh, you know, a knife in the back of the country, and uh, they want to to ruin everything and steal everything from the working people and give it to, I don't know, and that they are secretly controlled by the Jews and so on. On the other hand, uh, the donkey worshippers think that the elephant worshippers are a bunch of uh, uh, fascists, uh, violent uh, racists, uh, where parents were related before they married, and uh, the only thing they want to do is uh, shoot their guns all the time and steal everybody's oil, and they are secretly controlled by the Jews. Uh, so you see, there are some common points between uh, these uh, uh, religions, but what is very, very common between both of these religions, and there is data which support it, is that both of the people in both religions think that if they discover that one of their employees is worshiping the wrong God, it is very legitimate to fire this employee. And there is actually data which supporting it, and, and, um, and in fact, most people in Freedom Land uh, think it's very, very impolite to ask somebody, uh, what is your uh, favorite God? It's not considered something you're allowed to talk about in public. And people are actually prosecuted if they find out uh, that they are worshiping the wrong God. Okay, uh, and uh, we are talking about uh, this imaginary country. In this imaginary country, there is um, a bakery. Um, and in this bakery, uh, we have uh, the boss of the bakery. Uh, Alice, the boss of the bakery, is a, a very, very active uh, donkey worshiper. Uh, and, uh, and Bob, Bob, who is working for Alice, is actually an elephant worshiper. And here they are. So uh, Alice is very, very interested in finding out uh, what is Bob's religion. And for that, uh, Alice is uh, trying to think what defines uh, elephant worshipers. Well, they have this very nice website, which they very uh, commonly surf to. And does anybody know what is this website? It's another animal. <laughs> no, what is this? It, it, it first word is an animal. It's not an elephant, not a donkey. This animal is. Hmm? Hmm? Fox. Right? There is an animal. There's a website called Fox News. And, and uh, people who go to this website, they are uh, definitely uh, getting into trouble with their boss if their boss is a donkey worshiper. So, um, but you can also imagine that uh, there is a list going around in, in the web of websites which uh, people in the wrong party love to go to. And uh, if I find you going to this website, I will immediately uh, fire you from work. So, so this is our game. So we have uh, Alice here. Alice is the boss. Alice is the one who provides the network connectivity. So Alice can analyze whatever is going on in this network. Uh, and we have Bob. And Bob is trying to go to uh, the sensitive website. Uh, and if Alice catches him doing it, he will get into real trouble. And we are laughing here and having fun. But you can think about situations where, uh, you know, uh, this is this is less fun, right? There are countries in the world where if you go to the web right wrong website, uh, you will have a very very bad future. But let's stay in this in this bakery and and laugh a little. So, um, what can Alice not do? So Alice cannot uh, run software on Bob's PC, and why is that? Because Bob is bringing his own device. He has a, a maybe a secure phone, an iPhone, which doesn't run any untrusted apps. And even if Alice would tell him to run apps, he would not agree to do it. 
So this piece of hardware is kind of pristine and Bob is browsing uh, to the website and Alice is trying to find out if this website is for example, Fox News. So let's, let's sympathize with Alice for a second. What can Alice do? So Alice can see the network traffic. How can this network traffic help Alice discover uh, which website is being browsed to right now? So what can Alice look at in this specific attacker model? Okay, so Alexandra is saying, um, uh, indeed, Alice can run uh, a network analyzer called Wireshark and record all of the packets leaving uh, Bob's uh, PC and going to the network because again, Alice owns this network. And then uh, Elinor and Jens are saying, uh, Alice can look at the destination IP address. So each packet has its destination and each server in the internet has its uh, this address, a famous known address. And if I get, there is a packet, if I see there's a packet going from Bob's PC to the website, which is hosting foxnews.com, then uh, I am going to be very, very angry at Bob. Okay, and now remember that I didn't say anything about uh, what, you know, this website doesn't have to be in encrypted at all. It could be that I'm seeing all of the traffic running so I can even see that Bob is doing HTTP get to foxnews.com. Okay, so Bob is in trouble. So now uh, let's start, stop sympathizing with Alice and start very uh, unfashionably to sympathize with, uh, with Bob, poor Bob here. So what can we suggest? Uh, how can we suggest that Bob protect himself from, from, from Alice? Uh, and the first thing I'm going to say is uh, what is not going to work? And what is not going to work is we're going to tell Bob, make sure there's a little you know, lock icon, uh, make sure you're using only HTTPS, only encrypted connections. So why is using encrypted connections not the right solution for Bob's particular problem? Right, so, so Lear is saying very correctly, the IP address, this packet has to travel the network. So the IP address is not encrypted. Indeed, the payload, the, the encrypted payload is inside the TCP, which is inside the, the IP packet. So only the entire internal packet is encrypted. So indeed, Alice will not be able to find out what website, what particular page Bob is going to, or what is Bob's password, or what is Bob's, what is Bob doing on this website? Is he posting to a forum? Is he doing this? Is he doing that? But that's not what Alice needs. It's sufficient for Alice to determine that Bob is going to this website to start sanctioning Bob. So, uh, uh, so the metadata, as as uh, Tobias correctly stated, the metadata here, the the destination server, that's enough. So encryption isn't good. So we have actually a good suggestion uh, suggested by, uh, thank you very much, Elinor. So Elinor put down your rubber hose and, and gave me a very good suggestion. Uh, so we are suggesting that Bob use Tor. So what is Tor? If you don't know, you should know because you're going to be cyber researchers. Tor is a network. Um, okay, here's an advanced question if you know what Tor is. Who were the founders of Tor? And my hint is not a bunch of anarchists in a hangar in Hamburg, right? Uh, the, actually, the, <laughs> you're, the, the, it was established by the US Navy and uh, the US intelligence services, in fact, the Navy. And why did they do it? They didn't tell me. But the, the rumor is that they had all sorts of, uh, they needed anonymous and deniable communications for their own field agents and, and, and whatever spies and, and I don't know what. And they said, let's 
uh, have some deniability, if only the spies were using it, then any communication would be spies. But if we let all, you know, the people who have secrets to hide join us, then it's going to be what's called deniability. Oh, it's not the, the CIA the, doing this access. It's just, just some guy trying to get to Fox News. So how does Tor work? So Tor, uh, the O in Tor stands for onion, and this is an onion. Uh, it is, uh, Tor is designed as a series of, uh, of routers or, or relays. And these routers have a nice uh, property and the, the data which is going across Tor has a nice property is that each of these routers only knows uh, the next hop of the, the data and the previous hop of the data. So this fellow here, this onion, um, this is called the entry node because it's in the beginning of the sonar rocks. It knows that uh, there is data coming in from Bob and it knows that it's going to send it to somewhere inside the Tor network. It doesn't have the ability to discover what is the ultimate end uh, destination of this packet. And again, this fellow in the middle knows that it's getting data from an entry node and sending it to an exit node. And my friend here in the end, this is called the exit node, knows that it's going to be sending data to foxnews.com, but it doesn't know where this data is coming from. And as soon as there are three uh, relays in, in the path, um, nobody can find out uh, where this data is going and where it came from. It doesn't matter if the adversary is listening here or listening here, or even listening both here and here. So the Tor network is very nice. And now we know that uh, Apple has actually started uh, selling a premium version of the Tor network. And I haven't made my mind again about it yet. I don't know if it's good or bad. Uh, I think it's good. You know what? Uh, probably the premium Tor version is going to have uh, some nice bandwidth and so on. They actually designed it. They designed uh, the Apple's premium Tor. It's called, uh, well, how is it called? Apple Plus Private Relay or something like that. They designed it so um, uh, the, the, the website will know which city the that the user is coming from, but not beyond that. So uh, for example, if I want to watch uh, the Euro uh, or no, I want to vote for my favorite country in the Eurovision uh, and I'm not allowed to do it from my own country. I want to go to some other country using a VPN and vote from there. Uh, using Apple's premium relay won't work because uh, it will tell me that I'm in the same city. Fine. So now um, Bob listens to us. Uh, Bob goes to torproject.org and downloads uh, the Tor browser. Um, the Tor browser is configured to use the Tor network, and it's just a version of Firefox with some extra paranoia on top, and uh, everything works uh, for Bob. So Alice here knows that Bob is sending something to the Tor network, but she doesn't have any idea what is he actually doing after that. Right. So Eleanor is asking, uh, both nodes are apples. How can we trust that they are actually forgetting this link? So Apple has good business reasons to forget this link. And this is how they're also doing it with iCloud. Uh, Apple is designing their network uh, in a way which they don't know what data is going across the network. And this is good for them, both for data protection reasons and also for law enforcement reasons. So uh, if you imagine that Apple is going to operate in some kind of country which doesn't really like, you know, freedoms, then they're going to say to Apple, listen, you're going to have to give us all of the data which is going across iMessage. Apple is going to say, we don't know what this data is. So uh, actually, uh, Elinor, there is no incentive for Apple to uh, understand what is going across these networks, right? Um, 
And actually that, that, was, that was the story with Skype. Skype in the beginning was also uh, impossible to listen to. And then again, according to, uh, according to foreign sources, as they say, uh, the NSA says, uh, we have a $400 million bounty for anybody who can listen to Skype uh, conversations. And then Microsoft went and just paid for $100 million and bought Skype and put all of the network of Skype into the Microsoft data center. This is according to legend. We don't know if that happens. But okay, so now uh, we are in a good uh, situation. Uh, if Alice is looking at data coming out of Bob's PC, all she sees are packets going into the Tor network. So is Bob safe now? Is there any risk to Bob which remains in this setting? I'm going to give you, give you a hint. The answer is yes. Right? So, okay, pattern matching. So pattern matching, this is a suggestion. If we have something which is here and here, and if we can imagine, you know, the traffic on the network is very, very quiet. Nobody else is using the Tor network because it's the middle of the night. And uh, we can see the packet going in here and leaving out here and we can correlate them exactly. Then we can say, ah, Bob is sending a packet. A packet goes to the New York, uh, to the Fox News and so on. But this is, this is not really practical. In particular, it not, it's not in harmony with the specific attack model here where Alice controls Bob's connection to the network. Alice is not all over the place. She's just a, she's just a, a boss in a small company. So the second suggestion that one of the saying, uh, if Alice seizes Bob's computer and searches it, then she can find uh, the history of Bob's history. And again, if Alice were uh, the police, that would make sense, but Alice is just a bakery. She's just a baker, so she can't do that. But what Alice can do, and this is a real problem, Alice can do what is called traffic analysis. And what is traffic analysis? If you can imagine uh, two websites, okay? Um, one website is, uh, let's say, uh, YouTube. And the other website is um, some kind of news website. Now, how does traffic to YouTube look like? I go to a to, to, to YouTube website, so I send like a request, give me YouTube. And then the YouTube server gives me like the homepage with all of the movies. And then I click one of the movies, and then I'm going to start getting um, a stream of traffic. I'm going to get a lot of packets going this way, right? Um, because the movie is streaming, so I'm going to get a stream. On the other hand, uh, if I'm going to a news website, I'm going to say, give me the page, and I'm going to get the page and the ads, then it's going to stop. And a few minutes later, I'm going to say, okay, I finished reading this, give me another page. So, uh, so Jan is saying, uh, in general, the, the metadata, the, the fact that packets are going here and coming back, their timing, their relationship between them, their sizes, all of these are fingerprints of the website, even if the website address is not explicitly written there. So again, if I can uh, look at the network traffic, and I can uh, correlate it with the network traffic, which is the kind of network traffic you see if you uh, access my website, then I can do an attack. And, and the way it works is I'm just going to uh, point you at a very, very nice paper by Vera Riemer. Where is it? Okay, where did I put it? Okay. This is a paper by Vera Riemer called Website Fingerprinting. So how does it work? And it works. I am going to uh, uh, ask my victim to go to many, many websites. And in these websites, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to create uh, traces, which says going to website A uh, generates the following network activity, website B, website C, and so on. And then I'm going to train a machine learning classifier. 
And this machine learning classifier is going to work in reverse. So this machine learning classifier and what kind of classifier, there's a lot of art to building the right classifier, uh, is going to get a trace which was never seen before and say, ah, this trace looks very familiar to uh, newyorktimes.com, to foxnews.com, to uh, all sorts of websites of interest. And, and these attacks uh, are very, very powerful. You can get 99% um, accuracy just using the network activity, right? So uh, yes, you can fingerprint you know, particular websites. You can also fingerprint pages inside websites. So I can say, uh, for example, I'm going to, um, uh, let's say I'm going to a Facebook, uh, which kind of, uh, which Facebook pay account am I looking at right now? It, it all depends on, on, on your machine learning classifier, but you can get a lot of data out from the network. And uh, this is a real problem. It's a real problem. Uh, so an attacker who can look at the network traffic of Tor, even though the attacker doesn't know the source, doesn't know the, the destination, still you can discover the website. How do we solve this? So there is a solution. The solution is what is called molding. And a mold is a kind of a British treat, a kind of a food. It looks like this. And uh, people in, in the UK eat this. Um, it's wobbly. So a mold is, uh, the idea is I'm going to prepare the kind of network activity which looks like a website which is very innocent. And I'm going to record it and analyze it and say, oh, okay, uh, this website has data going in this direction and coming back and then this delay and that delay and so on. And I am going to create artificial data uh, which looks like this innocent website. And I'm going to have a, uh, the Tor Relay is going to collaborate with me. And it's going to, uh, I'm going to send encrypted data which says, uh, please don't actually just throw this data away as soon as you see it. I'm just doing it to cheat the adversary. Now the adversary can't decrypt this connection. So the adversary doesn't know which data is fake and which is not. Uh, so if I do traffic molding, uh, I can defeat a network adversary. So obviously I have to also ask the relay to send me data in the opposite direction, which is also cheating. Um, and if you can think about how to implement it, this is a big mess, how to implement it, because this, of course, you need to find uh, a, a, the right website to do it. And um, you need to have your website generate less traffic than the fake website. So uh, what do you do? Actually, it's, it's not very easy to implement in practice, but there's a lot of, of work about it. Fine. Uh, yes, so now we are working in this situation. Alice, the adversary, cannot learn anything from Bob by looking at his network traffic. And yet, Alice still wants to find out what is the website that Bob is surfing to. And now Alice is going to start cheating and using side channel attacks. And the cheating that Alice is going to do is, first of all, Alice is going to move uh, her attack from the network into Bob's computer. And you're going to be angry because uh, I think that, um, yes, Ronald, uh, Roland just said um, that, uh, I just answered Roland and said that Alice is not allowed to do anything with Bob's computer. So how can I all of a sudden uh, run code on Bob's computer, which I wasn't able to do before? So can anybody suggest, how can I run code on Bob's computer as Alice? So, okay, Elinor, correct. Uh, Bob has a very nice uh, program on his computer. Uh, and this computer, this program actually uh, is an arbitrary code execution backdoor 
uh, which is called the web browser. And any program you give to the web browser, it will happily execute it. And you're actually uh, using this remote code execution vulnerability all the time, uh, probably even to access this presentation. Um, why aren't we completely in panic about it? Because uh, the arbitrary code which the browser can execute is not any C++ uh, code which can directly access memory and write to files and read to files and, and, and run Wireshark and, and, you know, and access arbitrary memory and resources. The, the browser is running a very, very limited amount of code. And it's allowed to access a very, very small amount of memory, which is its own memory. And anytime it tries to do something outside of that, it is denied or it is ignored. Uh, and because of that, uh, any JavaScript code delivered by any website is going to be happily executed by Bob. So now we have a problem of how do we convince Bob to browse to a website under Alice's control. And again, this problem, you can kind of think it's not very difficult. Alice might say, listen, Bob, um, I'm going to need you to uh, answer, fill in your hour report on your computer, or I'm going to need you to, um, yeah, uh, I'm, we're going to use our corporate email program um, for our bakery, we have like a version of Gmail, which is our corporate version of Gmail. So you are just going to open, uh, so you're going to open, Bob is going to open uh, a browser on this computer. And Bob, you know, Bob doesn't trust Alice at all. Bob is going to open uh, uh, this website with uh, a different browser. It's gonna have a separate copy of Google Chrome running in incognito mode, just for running uh, Alice's uh, nonsense webmail software. And, and of course, this is, uh, this is, if you can imagine, maybe some of you have run Tor, the Tor browser, and if you can reflect on that, you can see that you are probably running Chrome at the same time as you were running Tor. So you had two browsers open at the same time. This is a very reasonable assumption. Now, as, as Roland was suggesting, and yes, if uh, Alice wants to, to do something, uh, right, exactly, right? If you're doing it, Slack is Chrome, everything is Chrome. If, if, if Alice wants to force Bob to do it, Alice can, for example, inject uh, iframes into traffic coming on the other end or do some kind of DNS tricks, but it's, it's something very reasonable which fits inside the attacker model. So Bob is running JavaScript code. The code is going to run a cache attack. The cache attack is going to look at the memory accesses of the target browser. This is going to give us information about the sensitive website. And then Bob is in trouble again. Um, we're also in trouble with the time. So let's do, uh, Linda, are you with us or only in spirit? I'm with you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for, for surviving. Uh, do you want to have a little break? We want to have a, like a 10 minute break. Is it okay? Uh, for my side, definitely. Maybe we okay. can do, yeah. So why don't we have a 10 minute break? Uh, we are return at uh, 512 Jerusalem, which is either 412 or 612, a central European standard time. Uh, 10 minutes from now anyway. Right. So I want to attack, uh, I want to find out what is this website. And I'm going to do uh, a cache attack. So I'll give you a little uh, story about the cache attack and um, uh, how we are going to um, adapt it to uh, what is called prime and probe zero. So uh, again, how does the cache work? Uh, we have uh, a lot of memory and we have a very fast processor and we can't get all the memory out. Uh, we cannot access all of this memory at the speed of the processor. So, uh, we are going to um, 
uh, add what is called a cache, which is a piece of memory uh, which is closer to the, to the CPU. And it is very, very uh, quick to access. Wow, this is so bad. I'm just going to, I'm just going to go ahead and talk and you, you'll listen to me three seconds later, it'll be okay. Uh, so the memory is very uh, slow to access, but the cache is quicker to access. So um, I'm going to put um, the interesting stuff that I need, my working set inside this cache, and then the processor will be very uh, quick to run, and that will be nice. So how do I actually manage the cache? So any piece of memory, any of the addresses in memory can be in the cache at any particular moment. And I want searching in this cache to be very quick. I want accesses to be very quick. So when the processor is trying to get a piece of memory uh, from the main memory, it needs to first find out if this memory is in the cache. And if I just stick this memory somewhere in the cache, uh, the access time, just the search time over the cache is going to be so long that I lose all the performance benefits of the cache. So uh, the cache is designed so that searching it is very, very quick. And there are all sorts of hardware tricks to do it, but the crucial thing uh, which you need to remember is that not all of the, um, so any particular address in memory cannot sit anywhere in the cache, but there's only a little piece of the cache, it's called the set. And this piece of memory can only sit inside a particular set. So the size, the set isn't uh, tiny. There are maybe 16 positions in the set. And this set, this little slice of the cache can control, let's say, 1% uh, of the memory. So all of this 1% of the memory goes into one of these sets. And there is enough room in the set to hold multiple pieces of memory. And now when I try to find out if a piece of memory is in the cache or not, I'm going to very, very quickly map the physical address of this memory into a specific set index. And then I'm going to look only inside this set and searching inside this set using some kind of hardware trick is going to be an O of one. So um, this is the cache. And again, you need to talk about all sorts of stuff like what happens if the set is full? Do, who do I throw out? How do I add new entries into the set? How do I maintain it? And so on. This isn't uh, for today. But um, the fact that this set is very, very small uh, and the fact that this set is shared by the victim process, but also by pieces of memory, which might be controlled by the attacker, leads us to what is called the prime and probe attack. Fantastic attack invented by Oswik Shemir and Tormer in 2005. And the idea of the cache attack, of the prime and probe attack, is as follows. This is uh, the memory, and this is the spy, and this is the victim. I am trying to find out if the victim is accessing the memory or not. I cannot find out what the victim is doing with the memory, but I can find out if the victim is accessing the memory or not. And if I'm, for example, looking at a very interesting piece of the victim's memory, for example, uh, I'm trying to find out whether the victim is executing a particular line of code or accessing a particular entry in a lookup table, you can think that this, is the op this opens the gate to all sorts of cryptographic uh, attacks and other kinds of attacks. So I'm going to, as the, the spy, I'm going to access, allocate a buffer, and I'm going to take control over, oh, the animations here are, are shifted. I'm going to take control over uh, a set of the cache, and I need direct physical memory access, or at least some kind of insight into the physical memory layout to do it. And now, um, because in my entire buffer is inside the cache, when I try to access this memory, will my access be fast or slow? I'm the attacker. Will my access be fast or slow? All of my buffer is inside the cache. So thank you. My access is going to be fast. Now I am going to 
wait a little and let my victim execute a line of code. And now my victim executes a line of code. And my victim, because I chose my memory correctly, is going to collide with the set I monitoring. There is going to be a cache collision here. So um, the, the, the CPO is going to throw out one of my buffers, one of my pieces of memory to make room for the victim. And now I'm going to access my own buffer again. Now, will my access be fast or slow now? The victim threw me out of the cache, right? The victim threw me out of the cache. So, so it's going to be slow. Uh, and now um, what's nice here is we didn't break the contracts. This is the terrible thing. This is a microarchitectural attack. Nobody is supposed to care as a programmer whether uh, there is a cache or the size of the cache or the set or the physical memory layout. And I, I'm not able to access the victim's memory. If I were trying to, if I would try just, you know, to read this memory out, uh, the operating system and the CPU will, will throw me away. I will get a segmentation fault. I am actually uh, doing something in the microarchitectural level. So I am, by accessing my own memory, which is completely legitimate, I am learning about what the victim is doing. Which is that? So this is prime and probe, and it's it's wonderful or terrible depending on if you're an attacker or a defender. The sorts of 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 tomfoolery you can do with a prime and probe attack. And uh, actually, uh, uh, when I was a, a postdoc uh, in Colombia, I, I found out a way to do a prime and probe attack in JavaScript, and, and that was a lot of fun. And and. Uh, basically, I did this. I found the set and I accessed memory. It, it was really nice, really cool. And as a result, uh, the browser um, makers made it impossible to do, made, made it difficult to run a prime and probe attack in the browser. How did they do it? So they did actually two things to make it difficult to run a prime and probe attack in the browser. And the first thing is, excuse me, the first thing they did was, uh, they made it difficult to find out the physical memory, which is backing a piece of uh, virtual memory used in JavaScript. So JavaScript doesn't really have um, memory. It only has arrays, but uh, it may, it's, it's not very easy to find out the physical address behind an array. And the second thing they did, uh, and this is a serious problem, they made it difficult to, oh, <laughs> Look at that. They made it difficult to measure uh, time. So does anybody know what is the difference in time between the fast access and the slow access that I just showed you? Well, the difference of time is 50 nanoseconds. Nanoseconds, 10 to the power of minus nine. Uh, so the timer resolution in the browser used to be nanosecond timer resolution. But they, they thought a little and they said, you know, people don't really need uh, this uh, nuclear uh, clock level resolution in, in the browser. So let's give us, you know, um, a millisecond timer, you know, five microsecond timer. So this timer is reduced in resolution. And now I cannot tell apart a fast access from a slow access. So these two limitations together made it impossible to run a prime and probe attack in a browser. So, now, from now in the following few minutes, I'll show you how uh, um, this kind of cat and mouse game which we were playing with ourselves, we're going to uh, reduce the attack surface of the browser further and further and still get cache attacks to run. So the first uh, challenge we have is we don't have enough resolution to measure contention on a single set. So how do we fix this? Um, excuse me, let me just skip this because of time. Uh, we are going to do uh, what is called a cache occupancy attack. And to do that, we are not going to measure uh, the speed of accessing a single set in the cache. Instead, we're going to measure 
the occupancy, the time it takes to go over the entire cache. And the entire cache has 4,000 to 8,000 sets. So now the difference starts piling up, right? So you have 50 nanoseconds for one set. If you do it for all the sets at the same time, you can get by with a timer resolution of a few of, of a few microseconds or even with millisecond resolution clock. So going over the set, if there is no pressure over the entire cache, is going to take something like two milliseconds. And if there is pressure, if there is contention, you're going to get six milliseconds. So if you have a timer which is, is that a sensitive millisecond resolution timer, you can tell apart an, uh, a free cache from a, a full cache. Now, this is in a, a single set. So this makes cryptographic attacks, as far as I know, difficult to mount. But uh, if you think about what a web browser does, a web browser takes huge rectangles and composes them, puts them one on top of the other, right? You have the, 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 this picture and this page, and these are multiple megabytes of data moving across. So this is, uh, this is enough to perhaps perform website fingerprinting. So uh, instead of having a single set resolution, I now have uh, only the entire cache. And this is effective uh, in 2019. Anatoly showed uh, in, in a paper with a few others that you can actually do website fingerprinting using that. So uh, obviously, uh, reducing the clock resolution isn't enough to stop cache attacks. So what can we do uh, to make it um, to close the attack surface even more? So the next thing we can do, and this is something that Tor browser is doing right now. Uh, Firefox is experimenting with the idea. The idea is now, uh, instead of doing a, a, a millisecond resolution clock, we're going to reduce the clock resolution to 10 Hertz, 10 Hertz, is 10 times a second. And this is a resolution so low that humans, humans can detect, uh, I think 120 Hertz, something like that. Uh, I can play two beats to you and you can tell me which one is faster and which one is slower. Uh, so 10 Hertz is, is really, really bad, for example, for gaming or for stuff like that. But if I, all I want to do is, you know, have an animation open and close and a menu and stuff like that, all sorts of cute and fun things for the internet, we can still get by with this super low clock resolution. And when we have the super low clock resolution, we cannot tell apart uh, a busy cache from a free cache, even if we access the entire thing. So how did we get around this limitation? Well, uh, what we did is uh, instead of measuring how many clock ticks pass as it takes us to, excuse me, how many, instead of measuring how many times the clock ticks while we are going over the cache, we are going to flip it and measure how many times can we go over the cache until the clock ticks. So this is sweep counting. And, and this is the idea. We are going to, and I'll show you the code soon. We're going to have a loop which says, go over the cache. Did the clock tick? No. Go over the cache again. Did it tick? No. Again, 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 again. And, and uh, once, after we finish a couple of times, the clock is indeed going to tick. And we said, okay, this time it took us six times to go over the cache until the clock ticked. This time you see the cache here was busier. So we actually got through in two ticks and this one took us seven, this one took us three. So we get um, a vector instead of having uh, how many milliseconds did it take us to go over the cache? We're going to have a vector that says, how many times did we go over the cache in a certain fixed tick? Uh, so Eleanor was asking, there are other ways to get a more accurate clock. Fantastic paper, wonderful paper called Fantastic Timers and Where to Find Them, dedicated to the art of finding these timers. Yes, if you can get a better timer, then that's kind of cheating. Indeed, there are ways of getting a better timer, yes. Okay, so um, this is uh, a way of getting around reduced timing resolution. Um, of course, we have less data now. 
So before we, we had kind of a vector for each one of these cache sweeps, we had a single number, like the time it took in milliseconds, but now we have a, a smaller vector. So maybe it's less accurate or stuff like that. Uh, WebGL, yeah, there was, there's a timer in WebGL and it was kind of closed in Chrome 68, kind of. Uh, there was a paper called Ground Poning Unit, Grand Poning Unit, which talks about it. Uh, let's just imagine that they fixed it. They, they tried to fix it. They said they're going to fix it. So let's imagine they succeeded. Okay, so this is sweep counting. And now, uh, so obviously we discovered that um, timers are bad for cache attacks. Um, so now uh, we're going to do something as a defender, very, very obscene, and we're going to prohibit uh, the web page from measuring time. The web page is not, our JavaScript is not allowed to measure time anymore. So how will I do this? Uh, you can imagine that, you know, uh, most of the web websites don't need to find out what is the time. So uh, maybe there is going to be a permission UI or some kind of deep learning uh, anomaly detection, uh, neural network, whatever, which discovers if you deserve to measure the time or not. But you know, if this is a general random attacker website ads coming from the network, you won't get any timers. And now that I, I, I don't get any kind of resolution on timers. And the question is, can I do a cache attack this way? And uh, this was our challenge. And in fact, there is uh, uh, a browser extension called uh, JavaScript Shield or JavaScript Zero, um, which indeed disables timers if you're really paranoid. You're allowed to disable timers for websites except those which you uh, approve. So what can we do if there are no websites, no timers? So if you want to go uh, get by without timers, uh, we can uh, take advantage of the fact that a web browser can always access the network, uh, right? I'm allowed to access the network. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take advantage of my ability to access the network to implicitly measure time. How am I going to do that? I am going to take an activity which takes two milliseconds and I'm going to do a race. I'm going to do a race between the uh, access to the cache and this network activity, which takes two milliseconds. And uh, this network activity, which we chose is um, resolving a non-existent domain. So as you know, uh, if I try to load an image in, in the web browser from a domain I've never seen before, the first thing that the operating system does is send a DNS query and try to find out what is the IP address behind this uh, network, uh, this name. And this access is, what's nice about it is it's at a UDP packet. UDP packet is sent immediately. There is no connection establishment process and so on. And, and so I'm going to send a UDP packet saying, what is this IP address, do you know it? And I'm going to choose a, a very random and garbage looking uh, a name, so the DNS server is going to say immediately this domain does not exist. It's called a non-existent domain packet. And this packet is going to be sent very, very quickly because this database lookup is going to happen very, very quickly. So uh, I'm going to send a DNS query and get a non-existent domain very, very quickly back. And when this non-existent domain event arrives at my browser, I'm going to have an, an on error because I'm going to have an error I tried to load an image and I failed. So, um, so I'm going to just measure whether my cache access was faster or slower than this DNS access. So this is called DNS racing. Uh, so how does it work? Um, I'm going to load an image from a non-existent domain. And then I'm going to probe the cache. And I'm going to check which of these two things happens first. And I'm, I'm allowed to, to do this. I can just, uh, so web pages aren't exactly multi-threading, but they are message driven, so I can do that. Uh, I'm going to find out uh, if the non-existent domain came first, it means that the cache probe took a long time. 
And if the cache flow came first, it means that the cache was relatively free. So now I have a binary vector which says uh, I was faster, slower, slower, faster. And again, I have a trace. Uh, Eleanor is asking, do OS's cache and non-existent domains? Uh, yes, they can cache non-existent domains, but they can generate random domain names. It's an unlimited resource. I just need to, right? I just need to generate a random ASCII string. No problem. So DNS tracing, what's nice here, I don't need any timer on the target. I'm not using any API, which is particularly suspicious looking. Uh, what is the disadvantage? This is kind of uh, kludgy, right? I need to find out, I need to find out a DNS server, which is nearly as fast as my cache access, but sometimes slower. And so, this is a nice attack conceptually. Uh, you'll see that practically it's, it works, but it's not as effective as the next attack. So um, no timers here, right? What else can I block to try to stop cache attacks? So there is one thing here, which I still can block. And this is the fact that I'm probing the cache. How do I probe the cache? I allocate a large block of attacker controlled memory and I iterate over this buffer. So um, you might imagine that allocating a large buffer of memory and iterating over it isn't a standard behavior. In fact, uh, when we looked at, uh, at a long, uh, a large amount of websites, uh, two websites which do it are Google Maps and YouTube. And most of the other websites indeed don't actually use arrays so much. So let's just say, again, I'm going to apply my machine learning in the cloud uh, server solution, and I'm going to prevent access to the array API, unless you deserve it. So now you can't measure time, you can't access arrays. What can you do now? So uh, we were trying to think what kind of uh, operation uh, does a web site do which allocates a large amount of memory and goes over it. Uh, but it's something that all of the websites definitely have to do. And you can't block it without breaking the entire network. And what we thought of was searching inside a string. So definitely string operations are something which you need to do when you're doing a website. And, and you can imagine uh, all sorts of efficient data structures for finding strings inside other strings. But uh, there isn't any good implementation for not finding a string inside another string, string right? So I am going to, uh, and you'll see it pretty soon, I'm going to create a string which contains uh, the content of uh, David Copperfield by Charles Dickens, which is open source. So we're allowed to do it. And I'm going to search for emojis inside, uh, inside no, no regular expression. I'm going to search for emojis inside uh, Charles Dickens' uh, work. And Charles Dickens didn't have emojis in that day. Uh, they didn't even have ASCII. So obviously, I, if I search for emojis inside uh, uh, David Copperfield, I won't find any. What does it mean not to find the string inside the string? It means I go, I need, as a code, I need to iterate over the entire string and, and then go to the end and then fail. So there is no nice data structure algorithm trick which makes not finding strings faster. This leads me to the following attack, which is called string and sock. And this is how it works. I'm going to have a malicious server here and I'm going to use WebSockets because uh, it's, it's, just a, it's just a server which is used for very low latency, uh, nice communications and all the web browsers support it. It's, it's really nice. And I'm going to do the following. I'm going to send a short pack to the WebSocket server. And then I'm going to lurk for emojis inside David Copperfield. And then I'm going to send another short packet, which means I finished. So now, uh, obviously, this is equivalent to iterating over in a, an array, but there is no reasonable 
excuse for a web browser to block string searches. So um, if the search is fast, it means that the cache is relatively free. And then the time between this start and end is going to be very, very short. But if uh, the search, if the cache is full, then this search is going to take a long time. And then I'm going to find out uh, this takes a long time. And obviously now the data isn't collected here. It's collected here in the malicious server, but that doesn't really matter. I can also do the attack on this side. So this is a really nice attack. We're not doing anything particularly crazy in JavaScript. You can imagine you don't want the web sockets. You can just do a regular HTTP request. It's just a little messier in the network. So there's some noise here. But accessing the network is something that web browsers definitely do all day. And also searching inside strings is something that they do all day. And this is a nice attack. So what can we do to block cache attacks? So there's only one thing left to do. And that is to completely disable JavaScript. So we're going to break the network. Uh, we're not going to have any JavaScript in our web, in our untrusted websites. And, and this might sound quite obscene to you, uh, but there are, there's a very popular browser extension called NoScript, which actually disables JavaScript for a large part of the network. There is a lot of engineering thought inside it to make sure that regular stuff that we like to use, such as menus and navigation and, and stuff like that still works. So there's a very large amount of heuristics and rewriting and whitelisting. But uh, we can imagine that if you, your, your browser goes to an untrusted website, you can get JavaScript disabled until you, I don't know, enable it manually. So now we are not allowed to use any scripting in our web page. And the question is, can we do a cache attack without any scripting? And this is the fun part. This is what we call primate probe zero. And the answer is yes. How are we going to do it? So if you think about uh, a web page, uh, a web page actually, uh, this is this piece of instruction to your browser on how to render a web page. There are actually three parts in a, in a website. The first one is the HTML. HTML uh, describes what is called the document object model. It means there is a text and a title and a heading and an image and pointers to other resources, you know, scripts and stuff from the web, right? This is uh, the HTML. There is another piece, which is actually the scripting, the JavaScript, right? Uh, JavaScript, you can do all sorts of fun stuff in JavaScript, but now we have decided that uh, we are very uh, worried about cache attacks, so JavaScript is disabled. But there is a third piece of a website, and that is called uh, the style sheet. Uh, also called CSS. Style sheet is a set of instructions on how to present the HTML. For example, what is the color of the heading? What is the, um, what will you do when you hover over something? Um, there is a very limited um, language, which is far from Turing complete which you can use to describe, for example, the color of links and uh, the background image. And what is the, uh, what happens when you turn your phone from portrait to landscape, what should you do with the elements? So uh, one thing, which is uh, two things, which are part of the CSS specification. One of them is string search. And the other one is, loading external resources. So uh, we wrote a web page, which doesn't have any scripting inside it, but what it does is uh, has a series of images and each one of these images is loaded only if there is a, emo not emoji, we did like some kind of random text, which isn't found in a very large text. So how do I render this web page? How does the browser render this web page? It searches 
for a very short string inside a very large string, it fails, and then it tries to load an image. And then it searches again, loads again, searches again, loads again. And this is done without any scripting at all. And now because I can't, obviously I can't measure time here. Again, I'm going to use a malicious DNS server. And by measuring the distances between the start and the end time, I can find an indication of the cache pressure. Fine. So these are the attacks that we discovered, but the question is, are they any good? Do they actually work? And let's talk about these attacks and let's see if they work. So this is our evaluation. Uh, we looked at a bunch of PCs and there was a phone here and an M1. This was the first attack on the M1, which was kind of nice. And an AMD, all sorts of computers in all sorts of places around the world. And uh, the game we played was uh, we trained um, our machine learning classifier to determine which of a hundred websites was the victim accessing. So we give the machine learning classifier a set of a hundred, a, a data set with a hundred labels. This trace belongs to uh, CNN.com, this one to foxnews.com and so on. And we let our machine learning classifier discover relationships between the traces and so on using machine learning tricks, which you can read the paper. And then we give this classifier, the classifier says, okay, I'm ready, I'm done training. Now we give the classifier a trace which has, it hasn't been trained on, it's never seen it before. And we ask the classifier, which one of the websites did we just give you? Now, if we had a useless classifier, which didn't, uh, wasn't able to learn anything from the traces, what would this classifier do? This classifier would just choose at random one of the 100 labels and output this label. So uh, it would have uh, um, a chance of 1% in being correct, right? Because there are 100 labels and the data set is balanced. So every time my accuracy here is above 1%, it means that there is some data inside the traces, okay? It means that my machine learning classifier was able to look at the side channel traces and discover something about the websites under attack. And now I'm going to animate this out. And as you see, um, in almost all of the processors and all of the attacks, we got worryingly high accuracy values. So it depends on a lot of factors and you can read the paper to find out what are these factors. Uh, but you see that definitely uh, there is a challenge to your privacy, even if you are using a very, very limited uh, attacker model. And this is what is called the top one result. So in this game, I told that classifier, give me the correct website. If you don't guess it in the first guess, then you have failed. But if you're imagining like a user privacy situation, another thing you can do is imagine what's called a top five setting where you're telling the classifier, give me which of the top five, uh, what are the, your top five guesses? And now the base rate here is 5% because uh, a classifier could just guess 5%, five random websites. And, uh, but the accuracy goes to very high values. You can just look at the paper and see. So uh, what do we have here? We have a cache attack prime and probe attack, which doesn't need anything to work uh, and can seriously compromise your privacy on a variety of computers. And obviously um, very difficult to fix. So now uh, we have a, a little dilemma here. So. We can do a quick demo, we can do Q&A and then a demo. Let's do it, well, you know what? Let's, let's uh, I'll set up the demo and you can just write questions in the chat. Um, I want to show you the demo. Demo is a lot of fun and you can also uh, use your own computers to, to do the demo. Uh, I'm going to uh, stop sharing the presentation. Uh, you can write questions in the chat now. Uh, and I am going to 
open my browser. And I'm going to go to Excuse me. Okay. I'm going to put the URL for the repository in the chat. Okay. And I'm also going to share the screen. And in the meantime, keep on asking your questions. And okay, this is it. Nice. And I'll just jump in front of it so you can see. Fantastic. Okay, so I have a question from uh, Jens. Uh, how is the network trace extracted from the cache ruby? So uh, there is a, there, that's actually a very insightful question. Uh, I said that by looking at the network, I can find out what is the website. Uh, but I can also look at other stuff and find out the website. In fact, uh, we actually did a study and found out that looking at the network can give us can tell us what is the website, but we can also discover the website without any data about the network access. And you, you can look at our 2019 paper on discovering it. When a web page is being rendered, uh, there are all sorts of composition activities. You need to take a bitmap from here, a bitmap from there, and you need to put them on top of the other. And this in, executes some code and render fonts and animation and so on. And this is actually done on your computer without actually accessing the network. So even uh, if I don't see the network activity, I can still find out what is the website. Okay, so uh, this is the repository. Let me just give you, um, I'll put the URL in the chat and you're welcome to open it with whatever browser you like, whatever operating system you like, whatever VPN you like, and I want to show you what's going on here very briefly because of our time. So uh, here you can see, uh, first of all, uh, two server side um, malicious servers. So for the prime and probe zero, you need a malicious DNS server. And for the string and sock, you need a malicious WebSocket server. So both of them are available here. And you can also see the attack pages. So there is an attack page for cache contention, and there is an attack page for prime and probe zero. So let's just uh, click on them. I'm going to click on them, and you're welcome to click on them with your own PCs as well. I'm going to click on this web page, and a couple of seconds from now, you're going to see a cache trace appear on your screen. And you've all, uh, if you click on this uh, website, uh, you will immediately get this uh, on your computer, and I'm sure you will get a different value depending on your, I can just give you the URL here, and you're going to get different resolutions, and you're going to get different uh, um, numbers here. It all depends on your computer and on what you're doing right now. Um, I'm using Safari, so you see Safari has millisecond resolution, so this time is in milliseconds. Uh, this is using Safari's internal timer. If somebody has Chrome, you will get more accurate numbers. Uh, Firefox, you will get, I think, slightly more accurate numbers. Uh, it all depends on your browser. And uh, if you look at the source code here, uh, I'll just open it using the GitHub. Um, you will see that there are some variables here. So I can either use arrays or strings. I can use web sockets or direct timing measurements. And I, I wonder if the web socket server is, is still up. If it's not, I'll turn it on just for you to have fun. Let's see if it, 
Hmm, I wonder if it's on or not. Let me just open my secret terminal window and see, okay? Um, I'm opening a terminal. I'm not showing you what I'm doing. But this is just a, if you play with the true, with the true false here, you change this, uh, you need to come, obviously, okay, this is visible. Uh, if you change this from true to false uh, here, you will use a WebSocket server. Let me just make sure it's running. You know what, we have no secrets here, right? we're all friends. Um, let's just, I'm going to share my terminal with you because I appreciate you so much. Here is my terminal. Does anybody want to volunteer? And uh, you know what, let's, let's leave it to the second attack. Uh, here is my terminal. Excuse me. And we're actually going to look at the second uh, web page now about the CSS PP0. Uh, I just want to make sure it's running. <gasps> no, it's not. Hmm. Let me just run it. Okay, what? New version of Python, I guess. Did they forget to install Python or something? Oh, Google. Excuse me about that. Hope I remember my, ah, I'm not allowed my, I don't remember my password, excuse me. Uh, excuse me. What is it doing there? Oh. <sighs> One second, I'll get it through. This is, the demo gods are angry. Hmm. What? What? Oh. I'm sad. I don't like this. The demo gods are angry. Right. So I'll show you the source code and you'll have to uh, give me five minutes until uh, this, this is, this is not right. What? I know what to do. I'll, I'll, I'll fix it. Okay. Okay. So here is my DNS server. And let me just make sure.
Does it work? Oh, it actually, what? Okay, oh, excuse me. Um, does it work? No. Excuse me, I'll, I'll get this, I'll get this, this will work. Yalla, it works, all right. So uh, this is a little small. I'll, I apologize that it's so small. Let me just grow it a little. So what we have here is um, a DNS server, which answers to any query with uh, the answer domain not exist. And to, to check that it works, I'm just going to uh, uh, exit, right. I'm going to, oh, who, is, who opened the, the attack web page? Raise your hand. Okay, so uh, I didn't show you what it does it, but somebody at, at the 217.237 just clicked my website. So anybody from BND left here behind the, a VPN who wants to try in your corporate network just to click on the, uh, it's, oh. So now I know which website you're going to. So I want to show you, so I'm happy that it works. Uh, anybody wants to playfully go to this website? Oh, I have another one. Okay, so what is actually going on here? Uh, I want to show you the, I want to show you the actual HTML here. So let me share it with you. And this will be the end of our uh, fun presentation. So I'm going back from terminal to Safari. There we are. And I need to resize it again. So uh, what does this web page uh, contain? And I'm going to open it with my own browser so you can see. Uh, this is, I'm going to click on this one. And when it opens, um, you're just going to see a lot of X's, probably you all tried. And now if I uh, inspect this, uh, you're going to see using the web inspector, you're going to see that this page actually doesn't have any JavaScript in it as I promised you. So if you look at uh, the HTML here, um, it's going to take a little while. So this is the JavaScript and you see there's actually no JavaScript inside here. Uh, but what I have here is a very long scream. And actually, you know, this was written during COVID. So it was from, my, from the bottom of my heart, this scream. Uh, and this is a very, very large string. Uh, for the purpose of demonstration, it's small. It's supposed to be uh, millions of characters, but just so this loads, I made it a little short. And now look at the styling of this uh, web page. So this is a CSS directive, which says, if uh, there is no sequence of these six letters in this huge screen, if it does not exist, so if it does not exist, then the background image of this letter X is going to be this file from my non-existent domain. And the next one, if this string doesn't exist, you have to load this image. If this one, this image and so on. And uh, as you've seen, uh, you might've done it again while I wasn't watching. Every time you do this, your browser without executing any JavaScript immediately, um, am I working, is this on? <laughs> are, you, are you here with me? Is, was, was I disconnected? Okay, oh no, just, just a, a strange message from Zoom that I was signed up. Okay, so um, this is the attack and um, you are welcome to play with the repository 
and, and have your own fun with it. Okay, thank you. Somebody just did it. This is a lot of fun. Um, and again, if you want to replicate it locally, uh, the server side, you, I just show you how to run it. It's very, very simple. You just uh, need to install Python and run a program. The program itself is very, very short. I can show it to you. It's in the repository as well. It's just a DNS server, which returns a non-existent domain for any, so this is the entire thing. Most of it is comments. It just returns non-existent domain, and then you have to measure time somehow. Okay, uh, I want to conclude because I'm a little over time. Um, let me just go back to the slides. Is this okay? So, to conclude, um, right. So, uh, cache attacks are very dangerous, and you can mount them even if you don't have a lot of permissions in your system, even if you're in a very, very restricted situation. Uh, if you don't have JavaScript, which is, I think is the most restricted situation you can consider. Um, and this attacks works on different architectures and all sorts of stuff can happen. And what do I think about it? And the, the, my thinking about it is that I didn't find a bug in the browser. I didn't find a problem with a processor. What, what we actually told you, what we actually proved here is that if you want to be protected against side channel attacks, you need to fix them at the source. You need to, you need to write software that doesn't create side channel leakage because the receiver, this, uh, this spy process, which is going to be listening, will always find a way to get at the data if it's there, right? We might find an, a crazy new timer. We might find some kind of creative combination of, you know, the DNS and CSS and magic and stuff like that. So if you really want to be protected, you shouldn't look at preventing these things from being measured, but you should look at uh, preventing them from being created altogether. And this I think is a very important thing, not only for crypto, you know, there is stuff like constant time cryptography, but also for secrets which are interesting for us as humans. For example, our identity, our browsing history, our minority affiliations and so on. And uh, I think this is all I wanted to talk to you about. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you survived. Uh, it was fun meeting you. I hope we will be able to meet in person one day. And um, enjoy Zoics and enjoy the rest of the tutorials. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very cool. Okay.